The International Relations of Africa. Now before we get into discussing the IR of Africa, we're going to discuss different types of state formation because this has a large impact on the characteristics of international relations in Africa. So Charles Tilly made a study of how war influenced the creation of the European states. And he's a famous quote, which is, states made war and war made the state. An important question Tilly asked is not where our current states have come from, but rather where have they all gone? There were nearly 500 independent political units in late medieval Europe and thousands in the world at large. But by the beginning of the century, there were perhaps 40 independent states on the entire planet. What had happened? Well, if you look here, we've got a number of states in the world over time, and it started off obviously with zero, but as humans created large communities, you ended up with the number of communities in the thousands. So there are up to 5,000 uh, political units about 10,000 years ago, and many of these were just villages. And then there was a, a dramatic drop as the states consumed each other. In the last two centuries, 69 of 210 states, about 30%, have died. And 51 of those 69 died violently. You can see here Europe in 1483. And even this understates the hundreds of smaller independent principalities and city-states present within the Holy Roman Empire of what is today Germany, which is basically represented in the center of the map. And this is Europe in 1910. So Tilly argued that through a process of natural selection in which weak states were destroyed by the strong in numerous ways, only the strongest states survive. So when we look at a state like France or Russia or Greece, we're looking at the survivor of a great competition. Tilly argues that over the millennium as a whole, war has been the dominant activity of European states. So for states to survive, they had to become more efficient. So in order for states to survive in war, less energy had to be wasted on internal disputes between lords and the monarch, and more effort spent on having a state's military forces looking outward. So feudal states were largely decentralized. They didn't have a central leader. Rather, you had a leader and there were other leaders that owed that leader service, and below those leaders were other leaders that owed service. There thus was considerable effort invested in the banning of private domestic armies of the different lords and the destruction of their castles. In their place, the absolute monarchs of Europe established centralized militaries under their command for external defense and police forces for the maintenance of law and order in the interior. You can see here Frelingham Castle, which was eventually dismantled in Suffolk. And below, you could see the Earl of Essex, Devereux, being executed in 1601 for his revolt against Queen Catherine of England. Now Louis XIII did the destruction of internal castles across France's interior and he probably destroyed more forts than he built. One of the beneficial consequences in England was that the homicide rate fell by 90 percent compared with today. Civilian populations, typically the aristocracy, were thus deprived of their right to bear arms. Although, of course, there were exceptions, such as the U.S., where the right to bear arms still persists. This also had the effect of disarming bandits and pirates within countries. And this was gradual and followed many steps to the present. Now, to wage war, it was not enough to have a centralized army, but there was a need for a wide range of supporting organizations, treasuries to fund the armies, and navies and supply services, mechanisms for conscription and the raising of armies, and very importantly, the raising of taxes. Later, to obtain support for war, states established assemblies and courts to monitor contracts to make states more wealthy and therefore powerful for subsequent wars. Here you can see the 15th century court in England, 
and the early 1600s British Parliament under Edward I. Prussia's original tax collection agency was actually a part of the General War Commissariat, which shows you the close links between tax collection and raising armies. States evolved increasingly sophisticated systems of finance to fund wars through borrowing, whereas in the past states relied on independent banks. By the 17th century, states increasingly relied on national banks and sources of funding. The first major weapons factories were built and owned by the state, particularly in France. Canada's income tax, in fact, began as a temporary measure to fund the First World War, but then after the war, it was decided to keep it permanent to fund social programs. The net result of this was the gradual transformation of European states out of feudalism and into the absolutist state system. Supreme sovereignty within the state for the purposes of war making were gradually assumed by the monarch. Louis XIV of France was an absolute monarch, with a famous quote, L'état c'est moi, and après moi, le déluge. For Charles Tilly, war developed the European state, and to a lesser extent, all states. Strong states occupied weaker states, and weaker states were occupied because of pressures emanating from war. In effect, for Tilly, it is not possible to distinguish between war and development. Since the technological momentum created by the Renaissance, it is frankly hard to distinguish developed and developing states. All states, to some extent, are developing all the time, just at different rates and with different results. Now, we have seen the phenomenon of war enhancing a state's bureaucracy in the Second Congo War of 1998 to 2003. Uh, it's estimated to have killed between 860,000 to 5.4 million people, depending on how it's calculated. And in this war, there was significant performance by militias from Rwanda uh, around the Lakes region. And they demonstrated an ability, uh, even without secure territory, because for the most part, they were expelled from Rwanda. They were able to uh, take control of a region, uh, make a tally of the resources there, implement taxation on uh, industry and individuals, take the money and then spend it without corruption and reinvest it into the military, which then performed much better than the militaries of established states in the region. And so we see that even in Africa, war is beginning to have a developmental effect on bureaucracy. A second type of state is the rentier state, a state whose elite derive national revenues from the rent paid by foreign individuals, concerns, or governments. It is typically used to describe historical Middle Eastern states that derive profits by taxing passing caravans or ships, but also those types of states that obtain revenue from primary resources like oil or gold. A consequence of rentier states is that they have little incentive to develop, socioeconomically, their own population, and instead buy off their population consent with benefits. They very often rely on foreign labor in order to achieve the various uh, economic extraction tasks that are desired. Now this lack of development and uh, its worst form, which is corruption, is captured by the term resource curse. So rentier states have a resource. They very often institutionalize it. They make it a public concern, so the government controls it. And within that concern, there's very little incentive to improve efficiency in their extraction. And very often it operates at a loss. In the oil industry, this typified both Indonesia and Brazil, which had large oil concerns. In the 1980s, uh, in certain years, these concerns actually ran at a loss, which is fairly inexplicable. It basically meant that key family members took positions in the oil company and siphoned off through corruption money from the organization before uh, profits were evaluated. Nigeria suffers from a similar problem because uh, they have such a large amount of oil that the resource curse also inhibits economic development there. 
The third type of state, which applies to Africa, is the juridical state. In contrast to European states, most of the states in Africa follow along the logic of juridical states. Most African states are the result institutionally, territorial, territorially, and in some cases identity-wise, of colonialism. These states tended to be economically underdeveloped, socially organized along tribal lines. Most African states are too bureaucratically underdeveloped to organize for interstate war and develop as a consequence of war, like the European states. African states face greater security challenges from their domestic populations than threats to their territory from their neighbors, essentially because the borders are defined by the former colonial powers and not by the African states themselves or by any geographically defensible logic. Consequently, transnational non-state actors can exert disproportionate influence on African states. For example, groups like the AQIM, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, Boko Haram in Nigeria, and the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda and surrounding states. Most African states, therefore, are centered around the capital and depend on foreign assistance, particularly foreign aid from wealthier states and international institutions for financial assistance. These states are therefore termed juridical because inter-African state territorial disputes are more likely to be resolved according to the rules and procedures of donors and their international institutions than as a result of the state's own military action. The African state must often compete with more organized groups, including religious, ethnic, and tribal groupings. This is largely in part because borders were determined for convenience of the colonizing countries, and at decolonization, identity groups were left dispersed across different states. The consequence is that there is more unregulated interstate interaction in Africa than there is regulated interaction, which is beyond the capacity of the state to police or limit. You can see here, with an ethnic overlay of the map of Nigeria, how the Yoruba and the Hausa and the Fulani people have their ethnic identity groups uh, also exist outside of Nigeria. So the borders of Nigeria were not drawn uh, by following the extent of ethnic groups, but rather was determined as a process of colonization and mostly in competition with the other European states. The consequence of the weakness of African states is that they are subject, as weak states, to the dictates of aid agencies and donor countries. The interference of these agencies and donors may in fact retard the state development of states in Africa. First, these states fail to push for internal development of their bureaucracies. Second, heavy borrowing makes states subject to heavy interest payments, to making domestic concessions in exchange for repayment alleviation. Third, the continued weakness of indebted states facilitates the interference by more wealthy states in their domestic affairs, influencing sub-state actors. There are a number of notable exceptions, like Tanzania, Ethiopia, Somalia, and Rwanda, which have all managed wars with sufficiently effective bureaucracies to support the effort. So now that we understand the situation of the African state as a juridical state, we can proceed with the international relations of Africa. In the African experience, there is a challenge to the assumed link between capitalist economic development and democratization. States with policies of state intervention have generally performed better than states withdrawing from direct state intervention in the market. The liberal recommendations by the World Bank and by Western donor countries is that African states engage in privatization and encourage the market to flourish. And it's these states that tend to do more poorly than states with direct state intervention. Number two, Michael Doyle defines liberal regimes as follows. Private market-based economies, sovereignty, judicial rights with an emphasis on individual rights, and representative government. So it's this kind of model that the donor agencies are pushing Africa to adopt. 
Francis Fukuyama wrote a well-known article called The End of History in 1989, in which he argued that there were two systems that triumphed as a result of the Cold War, and there was just no other uh, possible system that could compete against it. And that's capitalism as a creator of wealth, and democracy as a creator of personal and collective freedom. So number four, the African experience in contradiction to Fukuyama demonstrates that A, rights may be hierarchically applied in the sense that some people may be denied its benefits. So even in a democracy, simply setting up the institutions for liberty may not work. There may be other factors at play like tribalism or poverty or distortions that make it difficult to apply rights equally. B, fully procedural democracy may be illiberal. People may have patron-client expectations, which means that when they elect a leader, they expect the leader to be corrupt and to extract resources from their political position and to redistribute it among their tribal followers. And so uh, the democracy will become dysfunctional because whichever person captures the state will then be able to remove the wealth back to only their electorate, their constituency. C. Democracy worsens domestic socioeconomic stability. Giving everybody the vote in some sense can make different groups feel insecure because there isn't a high level elite arrangement in which the groups are protected, but rather having a completely free democratic process which almost randomizes what the outcome will be every election can lead groups to become very insecure and to actually use violence against each other in order to capture the state. Although it doesn't apply to Africa, the dangers of full enfranchisement and political participation is evident in the case of Bangladesh. The number of people that participate in democratic elections in, in Bangladesh is much higher than Western countries. But it's not because they're very democratic, it's because there's almost a desperate sense of being, uh, of fear of being excluded. And consequently, elections in Bangladesh are invariably violent. D. Democracy may actually cause war in Africa if it worsens uh, any of the issues uh, in the aforementioned list.